If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. His plan was deviously effective and carried out with nigh perfection. Had the being called Scratch simply waited a few more moments, he would have had the clicker. But he played his hand out too soon, and so a pursuit began. FBI agent Saga Anderson has the object of power that he desires. When Scratch wrote Return, he did not include this woman in his script. She's here because of the meddling of Alan Wake, his rewrites. All the writer's convoluted and exhausting, self-imposed rules became a weapon that the Dark Presence used against Wake in order to break out of the Dark Place. As soon as Scratch has the clicker, he can enact his own ending and will be loose upon this world. There's FBC equipment in the back lot that can fend off the shadow, but if it can hold off Scratch itself, that's an entirely different question. There's no way to contain him, but they can at least burn the hell out of him. Saga needs to prime three power cores first, and she has to do it with Scratch right on her heels. He wants that clicker, he has no issue killing this character who exists outside of his plotline. He can be momentarily halted with light and buckshot, but getting each core primed is trial by combat with this guy. One, two, three, she gets the lights primed, and thankfully it's enough to send Scratch away. This is a very temporary reprieve from the power of the Dark Presence, but, well, at least she hasn't been torn apart from the inside out. Saga knows that Scratch will be back. His rage is inevitable. So, what the hell do they do now? Saga, Alex Casey, and Kieran Estevez powwow in Sheriff Tim Breaker's office. All of them fully aware that Scratch nearly had them, and Yako Koskula died because of their oversight. Textbook boondoggle. And the FBI agents had a paranatural object, didn't tell Estevez, and almost gave it to Scratch. I mean, what's worse than a textbook boondoggle? Estevez deputizes Saga into the FBC, gives her a key that'll get her into FBC files so she can read up on their intel, and Estevez delivers a bit of comfort to Saga by explaining what an altered world event really is, and how it could be related to her daughter's current fate. AWEs are localized, they don't generally expand beyond their area of control. Chances are Logan is fine, but who knows what hostile resonance in possession of an object of power could do. It's better to not test that. And those FBC files educate Saga on a number of things related to the lake and the dark presence, what the FBC calls the shadow. It includes histories that Alan never got to explain, tertiary characters who got involved, the FBC's interactions with the lake and local facilities, interviews carried out with Wake himself, the nature of the shadow's power, and how it uses artistic minds. It's a big ol' info dump that brings Saga up to speed with current happenings. Via profiling in her mind place, she sees something is very wrong with Alex Casey, beyond a physical injury. The stubborn guy won't say what, but he calls himself Terminal. She tries to interrogate Scratch himself, but he proves to be far too powerful for that. He tries to take over her mind place the moment he's summoned for questioning. It's not a tactic that she's going to be able to use on him, but she could feel for a moment his single-minded drive to get the clicker. Her grandfather steps in for a bit to tell her that Wake, or Tom as he keeps calling him, wasn't lying about the clicker. The only one that can conclude or change his work is the artist himself, Alan. Then one more profile of Alan Wake himself, his words of floating like he's in a dream. Your friends will meet him when you're gone. Saga believes this means that Wake is still in the dark place, that the Alan Wake that they found on that shore, it was purely scratch all along playing a trick on them. Saga meets Ilmo in the hallway, standing beside his brother's body. Neither of them deserved this, they were just trying to save their home. Ilmo tells her that the cult was his idea, his craziest one that ever worked. It was to keep people out of the forest, make a local boogeyman, and they protected the area from anything that came out of the lake. They've been doing this in one form or another for decades, and after the 2010 incident, Alan Wake became their biggest target. Ilmo's never heard of anyone called Scratch, though. They don't distinguish between the two. Saga asks Tor in her mind place about getting Wake out of the dark place. If the Alan that they've been talking to isn't really him, then they still need to rescue the writer. And Tor steps in to help her scheme something up. You see, the clicker can amplify any art, not just Alan Wake's. They can't change his writing, only he can do that. But they can make their own art and enact it with the clicker. And it gets Saga thinking, what if they create art to rescue Alan Wake from the dark place? Perhaps something like a dark ocean summoning of the writer, and who better to create and carry out this passionate work of art than the old gods of Asgard themselves? Saga fills Estevez and Casey in on the idea. The FBC will haul their lights and containment unit to the Cauldron Lake shore, Saga will make some calls on the way, and they'll carry out a very special ritual there to save Alan Wake from the dark place. 
When Saga calls Tor with her idea, well, they're already good to go. The tour bus is loaded and they'll be at Cauldron Lake in no time at all. On their way there, they'll craft a song that will bring the rider forth from the Lake of Darkness into the light. During Saga's drive out to the lake, David finally calls. He tells her to stop, to listen for once. Logan is dead because of her and he wants nothing to do with her. She stole his daughter. Stop calling. Saga knows that she's running out of time. This very soon will be reality. Estevez flies in with the lights and containment unit shortly after Saga arrives. By the time she's to the shore, they'll be ready to go. Odin and Tor are just a few minutes later, absolutely rampaging through the forest paths that I don't think were meant for buses, but Odin is apparently driving with one hand, so don't worry, it's fine. Estevez and Casey will stand on an overlook, controlling the lights and dropping in ammo for Saga should she need it. Tor and Odin park themselves right on the water and will perform their art atop the tour bus. It is certain to attract attention from the Taken, from the lake, if not from Scratch himself, so Saga needs to run interference on hostiles. Tor and Odin have to get through their makeshift ritual for the art to work. For the duration of the Dark Ocean summoning, Saga loads Buckshot into anything that comes out of the waters or the forest in a tense gauntlet of rock and roll field combat. Tor and Odin don't miss a single beat of their ritual, a song dedicated to their favorite tortured writer. At the song's finale, an overlap is created, a spot where the dark place and reality meet for a brief time. Saga runs to the water's edge and, using the clicker, makes real the art created by her family. The clicker causes some sort of distortion, a change in the air, and Alan Wake appears before her in the mud, but then he's gone, whisked away. And nothing looks different now. Where is Wake? She stands there, holding the clicker, trying to understand this. He was just here. Why isn't he here? And then she realizes, same spot, same clothes, same position. Alan was safe from the dark place, but he landed at a different point in time. This is the ritual that made Alan Wake appear on the beach a few days ago, after she had killed Robert Nightingale in the first overlap. It was always Alan Wake. He'd really been out of the dark place this whole time. Scratch and Wake had been the same person. This realization comes way too late, because he's already here. Saga tries to tell them, everybody, that Scratch is Wake with the dark presence inside of him. He wants the clicker. She's going to lure him into the containment cell, and they need to blast him with as much light as possible. It's not as easy as just walking into it, though. Saga alone has to run around the beach, turning the lights towards the cell with a very pissed-off Scratch hot on her heels. Estevez can intervene at key moments to stun the deranged thing, to give Saga a moment to breathe and work. Once the lights are aligned, she lures Scratch into the cell, and with herself locked in with Scratch, the lights are turned on full blast. But not even this can hold Scratch, the Dark Presence. There's another nearby who can act as his vessel. Scratch bursts out of a containment cell, leaves Alan Wake behind, and moves on to a new victim. Alex Casey will be the new Scratch. Remember, he was written in fiction to be a part of it, a vessel for it, and Scratch has already put darkness inside of the FBI agent. He takes him over completely and descends into the field. Alan is free, but neither he nor Saga are strong enough to stand against Scratch. He takes from Saga the Clicker his ultimate prize. Deerfest is soon to begin, and within the fiction of Return, Scratch uses the Clicker during the festival to take over the world. Saga tries to fight back, and Scratch repays this defiance with brutality. He throws Saga Anderson into the lake, through the threshold, into the dark place. Scratch departs from the shore, clicker in hand, and returns to Bright Falls. It's finally his time. He flicks the clicker, and the writings from Return begin to come true. Scratch discards the clicker. It's no longer of any use, sending it back to the dark place where it will be out of the reach of Alan Wake. But here, another intervention takes place. Not from Morlandor or Adi. Alice Wake intervenes. She grabs the clicker. Time for Alan to be back in the driver's seat. He fully realizes what's happened now, and he has to be the one to stop it. The Anderson brothers follow Saga into the dark place, telling Alan that they've got another gig to head to. Odin tells him to take care of things on this side, and Tor tells him not to screw it up. Together they walk into the darkness of the lake to go take care of their lost family member. Estevez makes Wake's acquaintance and gives him a quick rundown on everything going on. He needs to undick this up. Alan is going to stick to his old plan, get the manuscript for return, and change it. The story is underway, but maybe he can still change it before the finale takes place. 
This is Alan's first time being truly free from the dark place after 13 years. No shadow, no scratch. He's in complete control of his own thoughts, his own body, his choices. He runs the forest path back to Saga's car, knowing what needed to be done. He at least gets a while to stretch his legs, shoot some Taken, feel the breeze on his face, drive a car even. He knows Casey and Saga are involved in this because of him, because of his writings. Scratch is out because of his influences. All this trouble is because of him, because of his desire to get out, to be free. But it had cost others so much, too much. When he reaches Bright Falls, he sees a threshold in the middle of the town. Return is underway within. The Dark Place has established itself here in this reality, and all caught within it will become victims. And this is just the beginning. Eventually, the world may fall to the Dark Presence. It had taken him 13 years to get out. He believed that Alice was dead, and that too was his fault. And he was going to make that leap again, this time knowing the cost all too well. Flashlight in one hand, gun in the other, Alan Wake will return to the Dark Place by choice, to save all those around him. Perhaps to save this world. And maybe once it's all finally over, he could try again to find a way out. But his time had not yet come. Back to that hellish nightmare he would go, feeling every bit of terror deserving of such a choice. But heroes must make sacrifices. Make the hard choices. Carry the burden. Fuck it. It's not quite what one might expect beyond the threshold. It's lovely. A bright, beautiful, sunny day. Deerfest is underway and Alan Wake is apparently the guest of honor, here to celebrate the launch of his new book, Return. The uncanny valley sets in pretty quick, though. People are talking like they're sensationalist reviewers reading from a script, and all of their dialogue is praising his work. But these are real people, suddenly finding themselves part of Scratch's new reality. Alan finds a copy of the book itself, propped up on a cutout display. On the back of it is a photo of himself in front of Tom Zane's old home, now the Valhalla Nursing Home, where he recognizes the windows of his writer's room. If he was going to do something to change the ending, that would be the place to do it. And after this realization, the town folk around him start going a little bit insane, a little obsessive and aggressive. They start chasing Alan through the lodge, but if they catch him, it won't be autographs that they want. It'll be cold-blooded murder. He bobs and weaves, makes it out, and jams the door behind him. It's like he's being chased by zombies. While it's bright and beautiful upon his departure from Deerfest, by the time he reaches Valhalla, it's pitch black outside. The lights of his writer's room are on, though, as if he's being expected. The doors directly into the manor are locked off, forcing him to sidetrack through the well in the center. Alice Wake, his wife, momentarily appears to him, calling to him, and it makes him question what's going on, if this is torture or a trap, because Alice is dead, right? She appears again in the dark hallways, but there's kind of a comfort to it. There's something real about it. Scratch interrupts this vision, telling Alan that he's home, that everything revolves around them. They can have it all, fame, worship, Alice, if Alan would just let it happen. The shadow pursues the rider out of the center to the steps of Valhalla, where Rose Marigold stands ready with the lights on. Rose knows what's after him, and she knows that they'll be safe in the light. She defines Scratch as pushy, and she's here because, well, she's here to save Alan, just like the instructions told her to. She found all his messages in the radio, the wind, the Alan Wake fan sites. And you know, I'm starting to think that Rose is one of the more sane people in this story. She just handles everything like it's no big deal. And she carries herself with an odd practicality. She takes things at face value and accepts the impossible. It's exactly the sort of flexible mind befitting the Lady of the Light. She orders him upstairs because he's got some writing to do. On the top level of Valhalla, the janitor Audie greets him, tells him that he's gotten everything ready and that he'll be around afterwards to help clean things up. Audie is a welcome sight, another comfort on this dark night. Alan asks if he can help him find his way one last time. And Audie, in his odd words, I think tells Alan that there's a devil nearing, but to not be afraid. He'll get the door open for him, and that it's time to reach a finale. Within this fictional reality of return is the writer's room. It's too late to rewrite the ending, so he'll need to extend the ending of return in such a way that the story will still work. It needs one more chapter. But the task of that, it was daunting. It felt impossible. 
Inspiration comes to Alan in the writer's room, a clairvoyant vision of something to come. He is speaking with Saga Anderson, discussing the ending. They lay down their parameters, non-negotiable aspects that must occur within the ending. Alex Casey and Logan must survive. The hero must pay a heavy price. The scales had to be balanced for it to work. The more lives they save, the greater the price. Alan sits and starts to write. Saga Anderson is now a co-author of this horror story that they were both a part of. As Alan writes, he realizes that this won't work without the clicker. Now within the dark place, Saga Anderson awakens within her mind place. Nothing is working, her files are gone, her profiles are empty, all of her work has been wiped away. The dark place feeds off of the vulnerabilities of its victims. And while Saga Anderson is not affected by the writings of Alan Wake, the dark presence can absolutely torment her here, break her down in the most intimate of ways. She hears herself panicking and afraid, alone in the dark place. It's another version of herself, every insecurity and bit of self-doubt within her. Her worst, most brutal self-judgments are made real and weaponized. This other saga tells her via profiling that she let everyone down, that this is her fault. She's trapped. She's powerless. And the real saga pushes back against it, calmly stating that it's wrong. Yet these thoughts, they are her own, made real. She's neglected her family for a job, chose a career over the people that mattered, caused her own daughter's death, destroyed her husband, left her FBI partner to suffer because she couldn't be bothered to stop. He needed help, he was depending on her, and she let him down. And the real saga, she starts to agree with this other side of herself. On the case board, she tears herself apart for her choices. Casey's pain is her fault. Logan suffered alone because of her. She's a terrible mother, a terrible detective. She's lost her mind. She'll never be freed from this. She doesn't deserve to be freed from this. The Koskala brothers were so clearly a part of the cult. She had their motives completely wrong, and they too were punished for her own incompetence. But then, little bits of hope start to shine through. Happy memories with Logan. Little joys that she was able to give Casey when he was going through a dark time in his life. A note from her mother, reminding her that she won't always be perfect, but she'll be amazing. Applying these things to the board brings sanity back to this nightmarish realm. She is her own worst enemy. Her worst fears are being used against her, and it's keeping her trapped. What's to come will hurt, but it's not enough to stop her. She's going to leave no matter the pain to come. The mind place returns to normal, her work put back where it belongs. She opens the door leading out, finding it to be darkness all around her. The unrecognized voice of Alice Wake reaches her through that darkness, telling her that it's time to wake up. Saga Anderson awakens on the streets of Alan Wake's fictional New York. After a few confusing moments, a phone starts ringing, a nearby phone booth. When Saga picks it up, it's the voice that she just heard calling to her after she opened the door in her mind place. The voice tells her that she needs to go to a statue at Parliament Tower Plaza. There she'll find a shoebox, and within there will be items that she needs to make her ending come true. That's all she gets from the mystery caller. While running around, Saga hears humming. Someone else is here. And wouldn't you know, it's Tim Breaker, alive and well, just sitting on a bench with his lantern, hanging out. And he doesn't seem too stressed about being here. He tells Saga that he was snatched out of the morgue by a dude named Warland Dorr. This place is ruled by dream logic. He hasn't been able to map it out properly. But he did have a page from some time ago that described how Warland Dorr himself got around. Dorr had been haunting Tim Breaker's dreams for years, and he knows that Dorr is somewhere around here, but he's never been able to track him down. Tim wonders if Warland Dorr brought him here, kept him out of the Bright Falls story, so that he could deliver this very page to her. That page, it details Warland Dorr walking around Caldera Street Plaza, knowing that the writer Alan Wake was observing him, writing him into a story, and Dorr allowed it, just this once. He would play a part in Wake's writings, though he would be serving a purpose that was his own. It lays out how Dorr got around Wake's fiction. He wasn't bound to it, just like Saga. He would come and go as he pleased. He simply willed his own doors into existence to reach where he wanted to go. This connection, this understanding of Warland Dorr, it allows Saga to find him in her mind place, to question him directly. She asks who he is, and his answer is vague. He stands between realities, like a door connecting rooms. He can be anywhere and everywhere. He is one who governs the currents of realities. She admits that it doesn't make a lot of sense, but Warland Dorr's origin story, sadly, isn't important right now. She'll look into it later. She instead asks him, how is he able to create and move through doors? How can she do it too? 
He again vaguely explains that it's all a matter of will. The family of doors have the power to shift between realities. Saga leaves Tim there, humming his song, seemingly content with his fate for now, and starts searching for a way through to Parliament Tower Plaza. And eventually, a door appears, somehow leading down a stairway, which somehow comes out into a subway system. The exit takes her up to another open plaza, much like the one that she was just in. It's an impossible city layout, made possible by dream logic and overlapping layers within the dark place. At the center of the plaza, there's a woman statue, and Tim Breaker is gone, only his lantern remains. He's in another part of the spiral where Saga just came from, poor guy. And that shoe box that she was directed to find, it contains the clicker itself, which Alice Wake caught after Scratch discarded it after using it during Deerfest, and beside it is a strange bullet of light. Under direction of Audi, Alan Wake had put photographs of these two things into the shoebox, photos created by Alice Wake. And that shoebox, it's the same one from 2010. It exists outside the effects of the Dark Place. It's like a safe storage box. Alan and Scratch and the Anderson brothers, they weren't the only ones that could make art come true. She created this photograph, this bullet of light. And as soon as she had the clicker in her possession, she used it. She made it real. She made her art real. And it's here now, waiting for Saga. This bullet is the antithesis of the shadow, created by Alice Wake to help her husband move up the spiral. It's not the deus ex machina to this dilemma, but it's pretty damn close. The payphone rings again, and the mysterious woman quickly tells Saga that Alan needs help. He doesn't have an ending. He needs Saga to help him finish it, but that's all she can say before the call ends. Saga understands much more about her mind place and her powers now. The woman said he needed help, so Saga enters her mind place, and she reaches out to the writer. They have a far more cohesive conversation than anything before. This is the vision that Alan Wake had saw when he went into his writer's room at Valhalla, what inspired him into writing that extra chapter for Return, what made Saga Anderson into a co-author of the story. She says they can use this ability to communicate to their advantage, use it to stop Scratch, except... Alan tells her that he doesn't have an ending and it has to be perfect in order to work, but he doesn't know what to do. He explains his rules. The story has to make sense, work within boundaries set up in pre-existing parts, and it has to fit the genre. This is a horror story. And the hero doesn't usually get a happy ending in horror. They bear the burden of paying the price for other salvation. Alan has a solution to save Alex Casey. He wasn't a proper vessel for Scratch. It's only possible because of what Alan wrote in his previous fiction. He can incorporate that into the ending so that Scratch has to leave Alex Casey. As for Saga's side, she believes that as a hero in this story, she has earned the right to rise above more suffering. She deserves to be a co-author. It's not just Alan's ending, it's their ending. So they're both the heroes of the story. But Alan insists that only one of them pay the price. There's just not enough time to do it properly. So. Alan settles on something not yet revealed, and Saga asks him if he is sure, and they both agree that this will be their ending. While Alan gets it down on paper, Saga runs back to where she came from, Caldera Street Plaza. She arrived in the dark place through the fountain, maybe she can leave that way too. She states this not really knowing that as a part of the Door family, she creates her own exits, so the fountain will be her exit, because she willed it to be. Saga runs back through the subway up to the plaza to find her way out, a door that will lead her to where she needs to be, the writer's room of Alan Wake. The Cauldron Lake water pool on the floor laid out by Audie, it gives her a clean arrival on the scene. Alan has finished writing the ending that they discussed. It's time to see it through. She has the clicker and the bullet of light, and here is what Alan wrote to be. Alan feels terror at what is to come, but doesn't hesitate to play his part. Alex Casey enters the scene, still infested with the dark presence, with Scratch. Holding the final chapter of Return, Saga Anderson flicks the clicker. As was written, Scratch leaves the body of Alex Casey. He was not a suitable vessel. There is only one who Scratch can use, and that's Alan Wake himself. Alan believes the bullet of light will reveal something to him, something that will end all of this, something that will save him from the dark place, from this terrible fate. He calls Scratch back home into himself, despite the fear that the bullet won't reveal anything. He continues to doubt. What if this was a ploy by the darkness, a plot that fooled them all? What if they're failing and they don't even realize it? But amidst the doubt and the fear, Saga holds true to her part. She loads her gun with the bullet of light, and she shoots Alan Wake in the forehead. But what if this is too easy? What if this doesn't banish the dark place, another dream, another loop, another failed draft that takes him back to the beginning? 
This is not the end. This is not the ending that they need. The bullet of light was not enough to destroy the Dark Presence. And here is the key, why they failed. Alan Wake does not understand that destruction is not the answer to this. He's going about this the completely wrong way. Even back in 2010 with the clicker, he didn't destroy the Dark Presence. He merely weakened it. It eventually returned. It will always return, so long as Alan Wake is just trying to destroy it. Scratch cannot be killed, because Scratch is a part of himself. You cannot kill the worst stories, the rumors, the pieces of yourself. This draft, it was a failure. Alex Casey is restored, saved. Saga Anderson pulls out her phone to call her daughter to see if they succeeded, if Logan is still alive. Casey asks, is it finally over? But no answer comes for Saga Anderson. They were so close. Death does not come for Wake, no. He'll return to the beginning again. But before that happens, he sees one more video of Alice. He won't remember this, but he'll keep the hope of his wife with him. Alice explains to Alan the truth behind her deception. What happened to her after the hauntings began, her memories returning, her intrinsic understanding of the nature of the dark place, the loop that Alan kept repeating. She made plans to save Alan with the faux art exhibit and faking her death. She misled him, and there is no apology in it. She had to, to get to him, to help him to where he is now. He will need to go through the loop again, repeat this horror story, but she will show him the images that he needs to see to create that perfect final draft. He's so close to realizing what he has to do. Saga Anderson, Alex Casey, Alan Wake, and everyone caught in this story must suffer the horror story one more time. But the next loop is finally, finally, the writer's ascension. We're not doomed to repeat our failures in an eternal loop. Before his memories of the last loop leave, Alan monologues of his greater understanding. This is not a story of only monsters and victims. There must be heroes, and for a hero plotline to work, there must be hope for a happier tomorrow because of them. Saga, Casey, and Alan experience this final draft much like the previous. Let's start with Alan during his draft of initiation so that we can see what spurred on the changes in his edits for the final book return. He goes through draft one much the same as before, but with profound, small differences. The first difference in the process comes in the backstage to Mr. Doors talk show, the first video of himself in the writer's room. Remember, Alan is projecting himself into this draft. His real self is in the writer's room during these adventures. In this video, Alan is less panicked. He's speaking about the spiral, how broken time is here, yet he's always moving forward. He remembers writing about murder sites, clues that he left for himself, small details from past loops when before he had no memory. The bullet of light, it allowed him to do this. It's like it's opening up his third eye, that wonderful gift from Alice. But he hates the idea of another version of himself, and Archon is writing this all to be. It's maddening, yet it's no less sane than anything else around him. Then, after his subway adventure and meeting Saga Anderson in the overlap for the first time, there's another change. And this one isn't Alan. It's Alice. When he gets to Parliament Tower for the first time, she has left a special photograph for him of himself with the bullet of light in his head. When he picks it up, he sees Alice, hears her calling to him. It's like a ray of warm light. It gives him strength. He carries this with him for the rest of the journey as a source of hope and a reminder of his wife. End draft one. It fails as before. So on to draft two. Switch to Saga Anderson. The FBI arrive on the scene to investigate a murder, only to find another body appeared as soon as they arrived, Robert Nightingale. They look around Cauldron Lake, find the witch's ladle for the first time, follow Robert Nightingale's tracks to a blocked off path with a mysterious note before it, and they decide that they need to go back to Bright Falls to inspect the corpse of Nightingale. But this time, on their way back up to the parking lot, Saga finds another of those strange manuscript pages. It's another page with no edits scratched into it, yet it has her name on it. This page talks about her feeling deja vu while looking at the corpse, like she had been here before, done this before, yet nothing in her past had been anything like this. Then, after Tim Breaker is whisked away, after the terror of the morgue, Saga and Casey return to the lake, hurried on by the writings in those strange manuscript pages and the possibility of something supernatural taking place. They met Ilmo Koskala for the first time, decided to investigate the area, and Saga found herself alone in the witch's hut. Once she had the lights on, another new page appears, or rather, new to us. It's a dark poem. 
the writer of the first word, not the writer of the last, with the terror of the light and the shadow cast. The third eye now opened to project the night. This is the moment to write. This is the ritual to lead you on. Your friends will meet him when you are gone. Then she proceeds on as before. She finds her way into the overlap, puts down Nightingale, and finds Ellen Wake on the shores of the lake, brought here from the dark ocean summoning ritual that she will do in the future. Neither of them knows that a weakened scratch is within Alan. The dark presence has already escaped. Then back to Alan in draft two of initiation, the murder hotel. Again, much the same as before. Same plot, same sequence of events, but an extra phase appears, that of Casper Darling former head of research at the Federal Bureau of Control. The paranatural entity Hedron, who was kind of a sibling to Polaris, the being that was with Jesse Faden, Hedron had told Darling that he would be disappearing back in 2019, right before the Hiss invasion began. It terrified the man. He began to act strangely from the resonance impacting him, but he survived, and it looks like this is where he landed. He's been trying to broadcast out for a while, but something was blocking his signal. That's not the case anymore, though. He thinks that maybe something moved out of the way, or he changed position somehow in this looping spiral. Or maybe the very nature of this place that he's in has altogether changed. Darling totally understands that this place runs on dream logic, but who is the dreamer? And as Dr. Darling does, he's been doing experiments, trying to understand this place better and how to get out of it. But there are no consistent variables, which makes it impossible to have a baseline. He's able to pick up signals of Alan speaking, though, the dreamer, he calls him, and he believes that this is the anchor keeping this place together. Well, if Scratch is a part of Alan Wake, and Tom Zane the filmmaker is part of Tom Zane the poet, then what's the dark place aspect of Dr. Casper Darling going to be like? Alan also finds a very special Night Springs season intro featuring Mr. Warland Dorr himself. In this introduction, Dorr is talking about an upcoming episode, about a writer trying to escape a nightmare. He notes that there are hidden few who know that he will succeed, but reaching that point will require countless failures. Night Springs will provide a glimpse into unseen realities, but that will have to wait for another time, sadly. It's all Alan gets. The writer continues on through the draft, ultimately failing once again, and then on to draft three. Back to Saga Anderson. She continues on through Watery, Coffee World, the second overlap, just the same as before. After putting down Mulligan and Thornton and speaking with Alan Wake a second time, she returns to Bright Falls to discover the cult has attacked the lodge, Alex Casey is missing, and the FBC has arrived to take over her investigation. She goes to see Tor and Odin at the Valhalla nursing home, and events proceed as normal. While Adi the janitor had a moment of panic in a previous loop during the height of the storm, now he seems fine, no worries or fears to be had. When Saga gets into Cynthia Weaver's room to get that record from her bathtub, she finds another dark poem. Lost on the shore between the forest and the ocean, the owl and the deer reflected in motion. In his room, he will hurt her. In hers, he is caught. His story ends, her story does not. This is the ritual to lead you on. Your friends will meet him when you are gone. Saga conquers the overlap, giving Cynthia Weaver peace and freeing her grandfather Tor. Another disjointed conversation with Alan Wake while he's in the dark place, she returns to the sheriff's station and finds that the dark presence has rampaged through it, killing almost everyone inside. Another change occurs here. Saga finds a new manuscript page, detailing something that happened at the lake house. The seemingly combative husband and wife team, Jules and Diana Marmont, had been studying the lake. Darkness overtook the facility, claiming the lives of all within. Yet it seemed to be a point of pride for Jules Marmont. What occurred within the lake house was because of him, because of his work. Then, a final dark poem is left for Saga amidst the FBC documents in the holding cell area. A pale balloon in the sky, float and sink deeper. Night springs when bright, falls for the sleeper. The surface disturbed, the reflection now a traitor, in the cavity of the skull turned into a crater. This is the ritual to lead you on, your friends will meet him when you are gone. Saga, Casey, Estevez, and the Anderson brothers meet on the shores of Cauldron Lake for the Dark Ocean Summoning, where Saga finds one more special manuscript page on the path leading down. It's about the lake being a dark reflection, a doorway, and someone is watching it. Audie, the janitor. Something was looming over it, blocking out the sky, and Audie pulled a bucket of water from the lake, took it to the writer's room in the attic of Valhalla, and poured it out. It would be needed later for Saga to get here. Audie was here to help. The Dark Ocean Summoning takes place, Saga clicks the clicker, 
And one more time, we go back to Alan in the dark place. He's on to his final draft of initiation, the Tom Zane Theater. He confronts the filmmaker at the hotel, telling Tom that he knows Scratch actually wrote Return. They have their struggle. Alan shoots Tom Zane in the head, which we know is all for show. And then on his way out of the hotel, another broadcast from Dr. Casper Darling is being sent out. He's starting to realize that this place is reacting to his own thoughts, but he doesn't know why. He has counted 665 days of being trapped here, even though he disappeared about four years prior in the real world. Time works differently in the dark place. He's accepted that the scientific method doesn't apply here. He has failed at every turn. It will require something new entirely, a mad creative mindset to help him out, an artist, and enter Tom Zane, as though he was waiting for this moment. Pleasant introductions are made, compliments and flattery. Darling asks if Zane knows a way out of here, and the filmmaker takes him into his care. Time for science and art to collaborate, to create something new. This definitely isn't going to result in a rift in time and space in the middle of South Dakota, right? Look forward to seeing your work, guys. The theater draft takes place much the same as before, leading Alan back to Parliament Tower. He sees Alice's final video, her faked suicide. He returns to the writer's room, shoots himself in the head in a fit of grief and rage, stopping himself from completing the edits on return. He is overtaken by Scratch, and at this moment, Saga Anderson completes the Dark Ocean summoning by using the clicker. He and all of his work are sent out into the real world, scattered into different points in time for Saga Anderson to find. And now we proceed back to the end, to the finale, with these changes in mind. Tor and Odin Anderson meet Saga in the plaza before she goes to the writer's room, not very worried about the chaos around them. They're happy to have caught Saga here because they missed her the first time around. Odin gleefully tells her that they've been performing on Warlandor's TV show, They Buried the Hatchet. Remember, Warlandor had told them that they would seek him out, return to him, and he was right on the money about it. It's still impossible to know what his motivations are, but at least he's not a foe. Probably. Hopefully. They can't follow her back to the real world. Their time there is done. Tom, or rather Alan, farther up the spiral, told them not to say anything, but the three of them will definitely be seeing each other again. This isn't a goodbye. They need to stay here to help him out with something. And now comes the conclusion. Through the puddle Adi created for her, Saga makes her way to the writer's room, and Alan gives her the final chapter of Return, just like before. But this time, he remembers that they have been here before, and that their choices, their actions, their differences, it impacts everything that comes after that change, and there have been changes here. The final draft will end differently. He doesn't speak with the terror of before. Saga uses the clicker, forces Scratch out of Casey, and back into Alan Wake. But this time, they're no longer here to kill a monster. No longer does Alan wish for oblivion. He has been missing a part of himself this whole time in the previous loops. Alice, he still feels her close. He still feels that hope from before. His dark place, the reality that he shaped within it, it was born because of his actions, because of his love for her. The dark place couldn't be separated from him any more than that love could be. And as before, Saga shoots Alan in the head with the bullet of light. It's taken so many lives lived outside of time to carry out this delicate process. One not perfect, but defined by the flaws of everyone involved. Perfection does not exist, but truth, truth does. Alan falls back into his chair, eyes wide open, the bullet of light fading. Saga Anderson takes out her phone once again, trying to call her daughter to see if Logan is safe, to see if they succeeded. And this time, Logan answers. Her mother's call woke her up from a terrible nightmare that's left her sobbing from fear. Logan asks if she can come home now, and Saga says that it's all over and she'll be home soon. It worked. Alan Wake stands back up. The bullet of light embedded in his head has become a part of himself. He sees it all now. The entirety of the spiral. Every choice, every loop. Scratch is gone, but not because Alan killed the monster. Alan brought the beast home, into himself. He sees Alice, feels that she's near. He knows what she did to bring him here, and he thanks her for it. Her fate will be left unknown for now, at least. And as for the writer, he has escaped the dark place, yet he is the dark place. He made it out, yet he never will. He carries the light. He bears the torch of knowledge. He will control and walk the dark place. All its infinite possibilities are his. Alan Wake has returned. 
to become the master of many worlds.